Greetings all and um, thank Greetings. you for joining. We continue this morning in our series. The unit theme is the gospel in Galatians. And we had the foundation set for us last week in terms of Galatians chapter one and chapter two. And Minister Carol Clark did an excellent job in terms of explaining the background in terms of who Paul was, the Galatian church, and how that work really started. And this week in chapter three, we're looking at all of chapter three. By God's grace, we will get through it. Um, if we could ask um, Sister Angela, if she could pray for us, please. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning and we say thank you for this day. This is the day that you have made and we will be glad and rejoicing it. Father, you encampeth around your people. And God, as we come before you this morning in Bible study, Father, we come with anticipation, ex expecting to hear from you. Father, we pray for Sister Candice. Father, we know that she has prepared and she has studied, Lord. And I pray, God, that you will use her as your vessel, my God, that she will speak, oh God, your word according to the Spirit. Father, that we will be um, edified, dear God, in what we hear. And not only that, God, but we will apply, Lord Jesus, the words, dear God, through our lives. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you this Bible study this morning and we say thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, Sister Angela. Um, we will be looking at the entire chapter, as I said before. I'm, I'm going to ask Minister Lil if she could to read from just verse 1 to 6. I'm not sure how many persons have had the opportunity to read through the chapter before or how many persons actually have the commentary. Well, I'll try to do my best to bridge the gap where there might be any gaps. And then I will take questions at various points as we go along. So if you put those in the chat, I'll be happy to answer them at an appropriate time. So we look at Galatians 3, 1 to, to 5, sorry. O oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Have ye suffered so many things in vain? If it be vain, if it yet be yet in vain. Verse 5. He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Amen. Um, may God add his blessings to the reading of his word. Thank you, Minister Lil. So in chapter three, by means of an introduction, we see here that Paul exposed the teachers, the false teachers who had crept in among the Gentile believers. Brother Gary, I'm not sure if things are working from your end, but everyone should be seeing the next slide. Yeah, um, Paul challenged the believers to compare what is being said in terms of what these Jewish false teachers were saying to them against the experience they had as born again Christians. Um, Paul also had a significant task on his hand in terms of to undo the effects of heresy that it had on the life of the believers. Because as you will appreciate and was explained last week, he started this work. We know Paul's background in that, yes, he's a Jew, but he was converted following an encounter with God. And as a result of that, he was now quite instrumental in taking to the, the gospel to Gentile believers. So 
Paul had nurtured this church to a point, and then these false teachers had come in and started to tell them something different. And we know that when we're born again, it's not just about theology, it's a way of life. So it was also how would he deal with the effects that these false teachings had on the life of the believers? And just a general note that false teaching can destroy families, it can ruin lives, it can split church, it can really have a devastating impact. So I wanted to speak just a little bit in terms of how will false teachers act? And what is it that the Bible says about false teachers? I see a hand um, from Galaxy Tab. I'll, I'll take questions shortly. Just allow me to lay the foundation. So how will false teachers act? That's what you should be seeing on your screen now. False teachers use words that we are familiar with and mingle it with heresy. So for example, within a Pentecostal environment, false teachers may make reference to the Holy Spirit or may speak of prophecies and signs and wonders because those are words that you would be familiar with within a Pentecostal church. <clears throat> false teaching, will seem biblically founded and also promise a closer relationship with God. In fact, there's a quote in the commentary that I really like where it's from G. Campbell Morgan and he said, no one statement wrested from its context is sufficient warrant for actions that plainly controvert other commands. He then goes on to say, every false teacher who has divided the church has had it is written on which to hang his or her doctrine. So with false teaching, there will always be something that is sounding almost as if it is the truth. It has certain biblical statements mingled therein, but you really need to examine what is being said. And in scripture, we are cautioned um, in St. Matthew 24, verse 24. It says, for false messiah and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. And in Matthew 16, from verse 6 to 12, Jesus spoke to his disciples quite extensively about the Pharisees, and he compared their false teaching to yeast. And this was round about the time where is he, he turned the five loaves and the two fishes into to feed thousands. And he said, be, Jesus said to them, be careful. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees. And he was adding clarity in that scripture and saying, I'm not talking about bread here, the literal bread. I'm saying you have to be aware of the teachings that the Pharisees are introducing because they are not completely true. Um, Saint First John chapter four, one to six also speaks of false teaching which deny the incarnation of Christ. No, that is a fundamental biblical principle for us as born again Christians because if the incarnation of Christ is not true, then the whole foundation of everything that we believe is not true. And we see in Judges chapter 17, and this, I, I quite find this passage in, interesting when reading through the book of Judges, because 
it's an excellent example of how far gone a people can get to when they believe something false. And at first sight on reading chapter 17 of Judges, you might think, why is this even there? It, it's not talking about any particular judge. In fact, the scripture makes it clear within the context of the chapter that there was no king in Israel at the time. But for those who might not be familiar, I would encourage you to go away and read it. I'll just give you just a little insight into what it talks about. Um, there was a man from Ephraim called Micah, and he got some silver from his mother, and he basically built an idol. He had a shrine, and he made an ephod, and consecrated his own son to become priest. Now, we know that there was a certain lineage that the priests were supposed to come from, and that was from the Levites. That the line, that's the lineage Aaron was from. And the Bible says that there was no king in Israel. So every man was doing what was right in their own sight. The scripture goes on to tell us that a young man from Bethlehem in Judah found himself among Micah's household. He was a Levite. Micah was so happy to appoint this young man as priest and somehow concluded that that meant God approved of their actions, even though it's an idol they were, were worshiping. So that for me shows us that we have to be careful what we allow ourselves to believe and to seek for real experiences which align with the word of God. So I'll shortly continue to pause probing questions to the Galatians, but I wanted us to see various references in scripture where false teachings are mentioned and also the direct output of everyone doing what they think is right, not being guided by the word of God. Are there any questions, please? See, no raised hands at the moment. Is anyone, panelists, got a question? No, Sister Candice? All right, so Paul's probing question, that's what you should see next, which is what Minister Lil let read for us from verse one to five. So Paul asked a series of questions, some of them seemingly rhetorical, and some is just like one question after the other. But the tone I gather is that Paul started the letter very strongly. He said, oh, you foolish Galatians, who bewitched you? Now that, that is a very strong term. He's suggesting that they must be under some kind of spell or something to change their belief concerning Christ. He's saying, you have accessed this new life by believing the death and resurrection of Christ. This is something that you yourself confess. He said, in other words, do you not remember the supernatural experiences you have had? Which there can be no other explanation except that that is through the power of the Holy Spirit. He went on to say, did you receive the spirit by law or was it by faith? Did these supernatural experiences happen to you by you keeping a set of rules or was it that you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and as a result of that, you then had these experiences? And for me, reading that, in terms of applying that to us today, I think it is very important that every born again believer, be it children, young people, elderly, at, at whatever point, 
you confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life and you are born again by faith, it is important that you seek for the infilling of the Holy Spirit because we might not always be eloquent enough to have quest answers for those who question our faith in terms of a theological argument. But the Holy Spirit dwelling in us will enable us to have the answers, one, and secondly, also to give us reassurance of our conviction and to give us power over Satan's evil devices. So there might be times when you're not feeling up if we're, if we're completely truthful as Christians, our experiences are not always mountaintop experiences. But by the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, we have that calm, quiet reassurance that, you know what? My experiences with Jesus Christ, they are real. I have proven him before, and I have every confidence that I will prove him again. Paul went on to ask them in verse 3, Are you so foolish that having begun, next slide, having begun by the Spirit, you are now being made perfect by the flesh? In other words, you weren't obeying any of these rules and regulations up to this point, and you have had the born again experience. So, why are you now beginning to believe that you can somehow be made even more perfect by following a set of rules? We see that as humans, we have a weird tendency of believing that something is more valuable if we work for it. Sometimes you will hear people say, if it is free, it cannot be good. We feel more invested when we pay for a course, for example, than when it is free, even if it is the same content. So, you might offer a course, for example, for free, and people will come one week and then they don't bother to come the other week. But the minute that they are completely invested whereby they have to pay for that course, they feel more of a sense of obligation to say, you know what, I need to be in attendance because my money is going to go down the drain. So in our humanity, <clears throat> We, we tend to believe that something is more valuable if we work for it or if we have to do something for it. But Paul reminded them that they were not saved by works. So are you now going to maintain being saved by performing works? You will see that these Judaizers were not, they were not disputing the basic belief in terms of Jesus Christ, you know. But what they were trying to do was to add stuff that the Galatians needed to do, suggesting a seem a greater investment that being demanded works or rules. Yeah? The truth is, Jesus did all the work on Calvary for our salvation. All we need to do is to believe it. And that is what makes the gospel good news. The realization that we don't need to pay the price ourselves. And that is reason to rejoice. Because if we all had to bear a cross and to pay the price for our sins, we wouldn't have this hope. But Jesus already paid the price for us. And Paul was so convinced about this, him himself being converted from Judaism, that he wrote in Romans and Philippians, he wrote in, in Romans chapter 7, verse 18, he said, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh or through works, nothing good dwells, for 
to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. In other words, I cannot do this in myself, even though I have the, the mind to do it. I still find myself sinning. And he, he went on in Philippians 3, verse 3 to 4 to say, For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reason for such confidence, show, shows this conviction. In other words, through Jesus Christ, we are the circumcision. We don't need, therefore, then to be circumcised because we come through Jesus Christ. And Paul is saying, I myself, I have every reason to have confidence in being circumcised because I am a Jew. But that is not the basis on which I stand. So we see that God's love for us is not tied to our performance, rather to God's character in that God himself is love. And we cannot do anything to earn his love. Rather, it is by faith. Are there any questions? There's still no raised hands, but maybe a comment from myself to probably tr help trigger something. So you, I think you asked earlier about um, false teachers, you know, um, the question of why do we or how do we? And I think just listening to what you're saying, Sister Candice, it is about, you know, the leading of the spirit, which then makes me then um, think about those who may be wrestling in the spirit um, and uh, relying much on what you call carnal or flesh. Uh, so when, because as I said, I think last week when this was raised, it's, I don't think it's by intent. A lot of people follow false teachers, but if they're not guided by the spirit, i.e. the flesh, it, it becomes easier to. Um, so just wanted to throw that out there. Really, I can see a raised hand now. Sorry, there, there, is, a, there is a question by um, Sister Donna, I believe. Okay, what could cause us not to execute the power of the Holy Spirit? <laughs> um, is that in reference to a comment I made earlier in terms, I'm not sure if I understand the question. Okay, um, I don't know if Sister Donna is, is able to speak. We've got Minister Lynn also taking off her microphone. So Sister Donna, can you speak or Minister Lynn? Okay, good morning, brethren. Good morning. Good morning. I just want to ask my dear sweet sister Candice, how foolish do you believe those Galish, those brethren were? How foolish? Can you um, elaborate a bit on that, please? I know you've already done it, but I just want to hear from you again. How, just how foolish, because I know there are times when the people of God sometimes are really foolish in their behavior, in the conversation, in, in, you know, it's just so, it, it really amazes me sometimes to know that we are supposed to be Christians, but we behave our behavior. It's really, can you define that for me, please? Just how foolish were they? Okay. So <clears throat> foolish as used by Paul there. Um, it, he, he was not talking about their mental capacity or anything like that. What, what Paul was, was referring to was without wisdom or thinking. They were acting in a way without wisdom or thinking. In other words, their actions did not reflect the knowledge that they had of Jesus Christ. Does that answer your question, um, Minister Lynn? Oh, yes. I asked you that question for the benefit of others because I feel that as Christians, a lot of us need to change, you know? Yeah, bless you. And that's why I pray to God every day for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And I pray the same for my children because once you have wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, the Lord teaches you how to behave and how to understand. Yeah, I am satisfied. Bless you. 
Thank you. Bless you. Um, Sister Donna? You got Sister Donna and you got Sister Patella Patella King, even. Um, Sister Donna, can you unmute? Or Sister King, can you unmute? Um, Whilst you're doing that, can I chip in there? Mm -hmm. Whilst Sister you are whilst you're waiting on the others to come in, but just in response to Sister Donna's question, and also to assist with the um, question raised by Minister Lin. Uh, sometimes the, the simplest things for us to do are the hardest. <laughs> in terms of um, accepting or even appropriating what God is saying. And sometimes the simplest thing that God is asking for us from us is the exercising of faith just to trust mm -hmm. and to accept what he says in his words uh, because um, we as you rightly said sister Candice, we feel as if unless we are contributing something tangible mm -hmm. to the situation we don't validate the experience mm -hmm. and we don't value the experience but God is simply saying it begins from the standpoint of simple faith, belief, and trust. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that, Bishop. Um, it, it wasn't a question as such, but just in response to uh, Minister Lynn's uh, question and just kind of echoing what um, Sister Candy said, um, uh, uh, had answered. I think one of the things um, and the reasons why Paul um, in particular was making it clear and saying how foolish they were, were was because they knew what the truth was. They knew, they knew the gospel of Jesus Christ, but they chose to follow um, uh, not the truth, so to speak. So, and, and I think in, in, even in later on in Scripture, Galatians 5 and so on, um, Paul mentions that, that you who knew uh, or knows what the gospel of Jesus Christ is, but yet you're choosing another um, uh, another message to follow. So, so Paul, in, in, in that context, was kind of just really echoing that you, you are, you know, foolish, knowing the fact that you know the truth. Thank you very much, Minister Carol, and um, thanks for all the contribution. And I, I think just echoing all that has been said, <laughs> There's another passage of scripture, and I hope I can paraphrase it right. To him who knows to do right and do it not. Um, are you familiar with that passage of scripture I'm quoting? Um, but it good and do it not. To him it is sin. To him it is sin, but also it it demonstrates a foolish attitude as yeah. well. Yeah. Because how can you know? Know to, do, to do right and then to not do it. So mm. that is what Paul was, Paul could not get his head around. And as you read from verse one to five and see the numerous questions, which I call probing questions, he's kind of asking them to think about your actions. Think about your own testimony, your own confession of Jesus Christ in the past. How can you then just go back on your words and suddenly trying to gain salvation by works? In verse 4, we see um, on the next slide where Paul said, Have you suffered so many things in vain? If it was indeed in vain. <laughs> and when I read that, I thought, Paul of himself, he knew the great price that a lot of Gentile believers were paying or suffering because of their conviction. And there was a point where they were willing to suffer, to, to receive beatings, to be thrown in jail because they were so convinced that Jesus is the Christ. And by faith, they accepted salvation. And yet they were then now turning around, allowing <laughs> these Jewish teachers to bewitch them, to then say, 
they then had to be circumcised or they needed to follow a set of rules. But we see here Paul like a father, even in that statement or that question he's asking them. When he said, if it was indeed in vain, I see and I hear the voice of a father hoping that they will see their errors and not make it in vain. In other words, there is still time for you to turn from your stray or your wayward ways to still come back to the truth. Mm -hmm. And the Galatians had risked so much and suffered so much to follow Christ. Mm -hmm. um, in verse 5, he said, Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by works of the law or by the hearing of faith? And Paul here is referring to Jesus Christ. It was their belief in Jesus that resulted in their experiences. And our Sunday school commentary has a nice comment that I like. It's from Bernard of Clairvox. And he said, I believe, though I do not comprehend, and I hold by faith what I cannot grasp with my mind in other words mm -hmm. your experiences they are telling you something very clear so even though you might not be able to explain everything but i hold by faith that which i cannot fully grasp with my mind my humanity cannot comprehend exactly how the incarnation of Jesus Christ happened, for example, or how Christ, one man, can die for the whole world even before I was born. Those are things that you will struggle to understand or to explain, but you just have to come to a place where you say, you know what, I don't fully understand, but by faith, I believe that he did it for me. And that is the simplicity that Christ wants us to have the childlike faith to say, Lord, I believe, help even the unbelief that still remains within me. From verse 6 onwards, and um, if Minister Lil could just read from verse 6, I'll, I'll tell you when to stop because we won't go through everything. But we want to look at the um, Abrahamic covenant because it's referenced there. And I just want to give a little explanation so that we can understand why that reference was so important. Sister Margaret, do you have a question? No, it's just a comment, really. Um, it, it, it just tells us how influential false teachers can be you know, in, in, in view of the lesson and when Paul is saying, oh, you foolish Galatians, you know, who, who, who has bewitched you not to believe what you did in the first place? And it's, in, it's just telling us how influential false teachers can be and the charisma that they have. And sometimes people can feel intimidated into, you know, changing what they know to be truth. Mm -hmm. you know to be accepting or whatever so just giving a little bit of balance here yeah yes it means that we really have to believe the word of god as the the comment that you just made there's some things that we, we cannot understand mm -hmm. but by faith we believe it but on the other hand it shows how much or how influential false teachers can be and and the thing is that we via the spirit i've got to call it as it is and not to tolerate yes it because it can destroy so many lives mm -hmm. yes yes um thank you for that sister margaret and what i have observed in my in my time people who um present a gospel other than the, the truth of jesus christ they tend to be very charismatic, exactly. well loved. Um, mm -hmm. They can sway an audience. Um, yeah. Sometimes they start off good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, mm -hmm. they 
and then you just notice very subtle changes in in what they are teaching or really what they are insisting mm -hmm. on. Um, but it 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 they can be very convincing, and 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 that is very true. What Sister Margaret is saying, Sister Dominic, and after Sister Dom, I'm going to ask Sister Nicole to read Genesis 15 um, as discussed. Good morning. Um, mine's just like a comment about how I really admire Paul and his ministry. Because like when you think about it, I know like he persecuted the Christians, but he through like the power of the Holy Spirit, he's able to get those same Christians to like follow Christ. And it's like in like now, if someone like murdered my mom or murdered a brother in Christ, how willing or how much would I be willing to follow them or believe in them? So it's just like amazing how the how powerful the holy spirit can be and work in people regardless of like what we do prior to having the holy spirit yeah that's that's it okay thank you sister <laughs> yeah, um no no one will murder your parents <laughs> <laughs> um sister nicole can you read genesis for us please Yes, uh, good morning everyone. So the scripture is taken from Genesis 15 verse 1 to 18 and it says, I'm reading from the New King James Version and it says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me? Seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer, Eliezer of Damascus. Then Abraham said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, Horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them four hundred years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And it came to pass, when the sun went down and it was dark, that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch. And a burning torch passed between those pieces. Uh, last verse. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land. From the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. Here in the reading of the word. Thank you very much, Sister Nikki. God bless you. Now, the, the scripture starts by saying, after these things, because this wasn't the first time that God was talking to Abraham in terms of his promise to him. In, we actually see in Genesis chapter 12 where there's an all-important event, where God promised him guidance, there'll be divine action in his life and his descendants, there'll be blessings and influence, favor. So 
it wasn't the first time that God was talking to Abraham regarding his promise. But in this chapter, what is significant here that I would like to draw to our attention is the covenant agreement in terms of how it was executed. <clears throat> and if you do research regarding blood covenants that were made back then, when God said to Abraham to go and get the heifer and the female goat and the turtle dove and so on, Abraham knew exactly where God was going with this that it would be a blood covenant that would be agreed. In the picture that is on the screen, I've done it for you to actually see the animals cut in two and the person walking in between the covenant. So if it was a covenant between um, two human beings, for example, both of them would walk through the animals that have been cut in half and they would make their declaration of their side of the covenant. So, for example, as you would with a marriage vow, you, you promise to love and to cherish till death do part, and both persons would repeat the same. So it was, a, it was common practice with blood covenants where they had animal sacrifice that those animals would be cut in two and both parties would walk through to declare their portion of the covenant. But here we see in Genesis 15 that it was a unilateral or unconditional covenant. So it was only God who spoke and passed through the sacrifice that was there. Um, Abraham did not need to sign anything. He didn't need to repeat a part of the covenant. And he also didn't need to walk through the animal sacrifice. I found it interesting that God put Abraham in a deep sleep before he moved through the sacrifice. The scripture tells us that because he didn't re require a response from Abraham's flesh. Abraham's spirit witnessed the covenant, but his flesh was also informed by what his spirit knew. So his flesh then, when he woke up out of that deep sleep, knew it was true. And the Bible tells us that Abraham believed God or had faith and it was counted to him as righteousness. And note, this covenant between God and Abraham was way before any laws that, that we refer to as the Mosaic law or other Jewish laws. So I've, I've spent the time to, to talk a little bit about the covenant and about Abraham because Paul's reference to Abraham in this chapter leads me to think that the false teachers were making reference to Abraham. And the basis of their reference would be that the Jews pride themselves in being sons of Abraham by lineage, yeah? And the Abrahamic covenant was unilateral or unconditional. And as a result of that, we see where Paul was able to explain that Gentiles too had access to that covenant. When you study the life of Abraham, you see that Abraham, as a result of his imperfections or his humanity, he ended up with two sons. One is the son of flesh and one is the son of promise. Because even in chapter 15, he's saying to God, well, those in my household, they are not my, my descendants. And that's, that's who will be my here. And God is saying, no, they will not be your here. I am still going to give you a promise. We know the story of Agar and, and um, Abraham and that Ishmael was born. But the point I'm trying to make here is that because the covenant was unilateral, even though 
though Abraham messed up, God did not go back on his word. And even from then, there was provision or allowance being made for the Gentiles, even within that covenant that God established with Abraham. So on the next slide, we see that the, the, the descendants, the Jewish false teachers were referring to the Abrahamic covenant to convince the Gentiles that Jews were the only authentic heirs to Abraham's covenant. And in other words, because it's in our DNA, that makes us um, recipient of this covenant. And if you want to be a recipient of this covenant, you need to convert or start to practice um, the practices of Judaism. For example, you need to be circumcised. <laughs> you need to keep the laws. That's what they were saying, in other words. Now, while the Mosaic law was given as a means of guidance to the children of Israel, at the heart, what God desired was relationship with his people. God is not so much interested in us following a set of rules. From the foundation, we know that God wanted relationship. You see that even in the Garden of Eden, the scripture tells us that God would walk with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. So he wanted fellowship or relationship with them. Um, but here, the reference to Abraham, we, we see where he was found faithful even before the law was established in terms of the Mosaic law. Therefore, Father Abraham was mentioned as the father of faith in, in Hebrews. And it is important to acknowledge that the laws were intended for the Jews and not the church, the body of Christ, which is what um, these Jewish false teachers were trying to do. They were trying to impose the law on these born again believers. So Paul's reference to the Abrahamic covenant was to show the Gentiles that they are sons of Abraham by faith because Abraham did not verbally or physically agree in this covenant. It was unilateral. So God made provision for all of us. And even in Jeremiah, as far back as in the Old Testament, we see where a new covenant is prophesied. And this new covenant is through faith in Jesus. That is the only way that we can access this new covenant. Are there any questions so far on anything that has been said? No, we can't see any questions or comments being raised. Okay. That's fine. Um, I'll, I'll try to wrap up in the next couple of minutes or so. Um, I trust we are absorbing all that is being said in terms of the significance of the covenant and that as Gentiles by faith, we also have access to the blessings of Abraham and we get that access through Jesus Christ. So Paul talks to them about reject reliance on the law. Um, on our next slide, we see that Paul posed the problem of the law's demand for perfection. <clears throat> and this is a little further on in, in chapter 3, where he's saying, failure of complying with the law is a curse. And that's stated in Deuteronomy 27, verse 26, in order to gain the promises of the law, you had to live the law perfectly. And since our humanity could not fulfill the law, Jesus became a curse for us by dying on a tree or a cross. And that's Deuteronomy 21, verse 23. And also Paul referenced that in verse 13 of Galatians. So in place of judgment, we rightly deserved. We are justified by faith. In other words, the just 
shall live by faith. And that really is the whole summary of the lesson. Now, righteousness and faith are inseparable in the life of a believer because faith in Christ makes us righteous before God. There is no other means by which we can be seen as righteous before our holy God. But right living is also evidence of a life of faith. In other words, when we live a righteous life, when we live right, it is evidence of our life of faith. Hence, we see that faith is both a fruit and a gift of the Spirit. Yeah? A life of righteousness will produce the fruit of faith. So when we live a, a life in right standing, enabled through the power of the Holy Spirit, we will see the fruit of faith. Uh, the Bible tells us that we will have faith even to move mountains. That, that is the product that we can live and practice and expect when we live a life of right standing through Jesus Christ, not in our own doing. So we receive God's promise by faith. You'll see that on your next slide, that the work of Christ and its application to our life is not mere potential. And what, what do I mean by that? Potential speaks of a possibility or a likelihood of something happening. So it could happen or it could not happen. That's not, that's not the accomplished work of Christ. It is an accomplished work of Christ that we accept. Not, we accept it by faith, not of works. So the work of Christ and its application to our life it's not mere potential. It's a work already done. The only thing that we need to do is to believe. The promise we receive by faith was already accomplished when Jesus said it is finished. The debt was paid in full. So there is nothing outstanding that we then need to demonstrate through works. You know, sometimes there is a partial agreement, even with um, children or so, you may say to them, in order to, to get them to do their part, you'll say, okay, I'll do 90% and you will do 10%. There is nothing like that. 100% has already been done. All that we need to do is to accept it by faith, and then no works are necessary because we cannot by any works gain our salvation. It is accomplished only by faith in Jesus Christ. And this gives us access to all the benefits that come with being a joint here with Jesus. Our only mediator is Jesus Christ. And that should be reassuring to us as believers. Because if you think back to the days of the priesthood, the day of atonement, you would go and the priest would make atonement and there would be this big preparation. You would go into the Holy of Holies and you would wait. But even that in itself is a constant reminder of your sin. Because each year you're having to come to make for the priest to make atonement for you and no one could access the holy of holies except the priest himself and if he went in and he wasn't right he would die in the presence of a holy god but now bless god through the work that was done on calvary jesus christ makes intercession for us this is not to say that we will not sin or we will live a perfect life but when we acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord of our life and through faith accept his death and resurrection and the born again experience that that gives us, we are then able to in confidence 
know that Jesus is our mediator and he is making intercession for us. Only faith in Christ can bring redemption and forgiveness of sin. Therefore, we must live by faith. It is not optional. There is nothing at all that we can do that will be able to give us access to the benefits of being a born again child of God. In concluding, and this is my last slide, God is looking for a people who will trust him completely. And if we take nothing else away from today, even if we cannot fully explain about the Abrahamic covenant or the Mosaic law or when things started, if we take nothing away, God wants a people who will trust him. Just simple faith. Trust in God is not equivalent to a life of ease. It's not that if we say we trust God fully, we then will have no problems and we will just have easy street. That's not the case. But we must depend on God's word in all circumstances. So irrespective of what you will hear others say, ensure that what you believe aligns with the word of God. A life of faith embodies spending time with God. It is difficult to trust someone you do not have a relationship with. You cannot just develop faith just like that. That will keep you, that you can live by unless you are going to spend time with God and get to know him. God gives us confidence to enter the throne room of God. Faith gives us confidence, rather, to enter the throne room of God through prayer and to make intercession for ourselves and for others. So even in this time of lockdown, where we are not able to come together as a church, where we cannot collectively meet in the same building physically, in your own quiet time, we have the confidence that we can enter the throne room of God through prayer and to make intercession for ourselves and for others. Galatians 3 verse 11 says that no man is justified by law in the sight of God. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. God bless you. If there are any questions in the chat, I will do my best to answer those. But I trust that we have taken something away today that we can live by faith in Jesus Christ. God bless you. God bless you, Sister Candice. Thank you. Um, we, we do have a, a few minutes left, you know, allocated. So I don't know if there's anybody with questions or remarks. I just want to thank you for, for that because as you've just done that conclusion, you know, faith, it, 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 what came to me was we have to come out of our comfort zone. Um, having faith in God means that we have to come out of our comfort zone and let go. Um, and that's a wrestle, uh, again, with everybody, I would suggest, um, especially with me. And it's only by coming out of your comfort zone, leaning on God, you know, you receive that benefit as well. Um, but uh, again, thank you again. Um, I don't know if uh, anyone else any closing remarks. Yeah, I, I had a, um, a comment, you know, thinking about... Um, Thinking about some of the things that Paul was addressing and the whole circumcision and he was he knew that once they stepped into Judaism they would be stepping back into the law and we know mm. you have to fulfill all the law or none at all mm. um, but it's the it's the fact that even today what happens is we move away from faith and we, we, we we're stuck in legalism and once mm. we become legalism legalist then we we step out of liberty so the freedom and the liberty we have in christ we lose it when we become legalists so all the rules and regulations that we do to keep people in line actually decrease the ability for us to walk in the spirit and walk by faith mm -hmm. because now we're following the rules and regulations and say well we've done this we've done that we're doing this so then i'm okay with god but it's not by those works but it's by faith and the more liberty we have in christ the freedom 
to not to sin is what is what we've got not so much oh if we give them too much freedom then they're going to go crazy and do whatever they want and i think that's where we have to be careful that we don't become so legalist in our churches that we actually take away the ability for people to walk by faith amen, amen. thank you for that uh, minister lil and uh, minister rob and the thought that came to me as uh, minister lil was talking just now is the legalistic approach your heart is not involved because you can just follow the rules you don't have to believe them um if you think of driving along the road when you see the camera you slow down but it doesn't mean that you're not going to break the speed limit but living by faith require it's from the heart your your heart must align to the word of god in order to live by faith and and that's what god wants he wants our heart and it is only by giving him our heart that we are able to truly live a life of faith legalism just talks about rules so you just you can just follow them you don't have to have any commitment from your heart but it is a heart matter to live by faith bless god